All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Journal Club. This is the fourth and final in a series of four we had scheduled. Today's topic is pre-op urinalysis before orthopedic surgery. What is the current evidence? My name is Shruti Murali. I am an improvement advisor at the Wisconsin Hospital Association, and I will be coordinating today's event. For those of you not familiar with this technology, we're using a web-based video conferencing platform called Zoom. As of now, all of your mics are muted and all of your video feeds are active, meaning if you have a camera attached, it is on. Uh, even though there are a lot of people present today, this is meant to be an interactive event, and we will look to you to participate during the case studies. Uh, when you would like to say something, please unmute your line. There's a little mic icon at the bottom left of your screen, and when you're done, go ahead and mute it again by clicking the icon. If you're calling in using a phone, you need to press star six to mute and unmute. These directions are also written in the chat. For those participating in the live session and only in the live session, uh, have the ability to earn a continuing medical education or a CME credit. I will, after the event, send you all a document containing instructions to claim your certificate. One note, the portal will be active starting right after this event and will close on November 15th, 2018 at 4 p.m. Central Time. You can't do it after that and, that and we can't really help you if you miss that deadline. This event is being recorded and a link will be made available to you. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. But otherwise, let me go ahead and introduce to you your facilitator for today, Dr. Bobby Redwood. Dr. Redwood is an MD and PH. He's a graduate of the Rush University School of Medicine in Chicago and the University of Wisconsin Emergency Medicine and Preventative Residencies. He works full-time as an emergency and preventative medicine physician at Divine Savior Hospital in Portage, Wisconsin, and is chair of the hospital's antimicrobial stewardship committee. Dr. Redwood also teaches resident physicians and publishes research as a clinical adjunct professor for the UW Department of Family Medicine. He is the immediate past president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. So now I'm just gonna hand it over to Dr. Redwood. Thanks, Ruthie. I think you guys all know me by now, so we gotta shorten that intro. Um, this is a very exciting topic, actually. I know we, we like to nerd out on antibiotics here, but it really goes to show we have almost 200 participants today. And I think the reason that this is such a well-attended webinar is because um, it really is the topic of the day. Uh, so to put it in perspective, um, the 2018 literature says that 70% of U.S. hospitals right now are still doing pre-op urinalysis before total joint arthroplasty. And um, some personal perspective, at my hospital, as of October 2018, so this month, we um, are actually stopped that practice. So we now screen for symptoms, but we no longer do um, universal screening of urinalysis before total joint arthroplasty. Um, and so as we get into the uh, case presentation, I really would like to hear, I'm gonna you know, give a pause, and I really would like to hear from our, our members out there and people listening, what's the scene at your hospital? What, what's going on? Is, is it a conversation? Has the conversation been started? Is there some confusion about the literature? Is this a brand new topic for you? Or are you, is this kind of a thing of the past and you dealt with it last year? I would love to hear where everyone's at. And so um, we're gonna switch it up a little bit this time. I'm actually gonna present the cases first thing, and then we'll go into a deep dive on asymptomatic bacteriuria, um, talk about the cases again, and then go into a literature review for the most current evidence on this topic. I have no financial disclosures. No one wants to give money to someone who offers or who tries to advocate for fewer antibiotics. So there are no drug reps knocking at my door. Um, and let's get right into case one. Remember, don't be bashful, unmute your line. What would you do in this situation? What would your hospital do in this situation? I know we have a mixed group here. We have um, so physicians with us, obviously, we have APPs with us, we have nurse managers, we have joint journey coordinators, we have quality improvement professionals. What is the scene at your hospital when an 82-year-old female, alert and oriented times three, no urinary issues, comes in for a pre-op clearance for a total shoulder? Her family says, hey, she has a history of UTIs, should we do a UA before the surgery? What happens at your hospital? One or two brave souls want to chime in? It helps me too to know there's an audience out there. I'm in a small room by myself, so.
All right. I think you I think you guys will get less bashful as we go here. Case two, what do you do in this situation? So the first one was asymptomatic person comes in, you sort of have the option to send the urinalysis. This is a 75-year-old female. She has no symptoms, but now the the family physician beforehand has was already done has already done the pre-op clearance and you have a urine culture in front of you. So it's growing pseudomonas, a nice sticky bug that likes to stick to prostheses. So what do we do in this situation? She's going in for a total knee and we already have an organism growing. And since we're all eating our sandwiches, we'll go on to case three. What do you do here? So this is, by the way, this is a catheter cowboy. If you watch uh, the John Oliver show, it's hilarious. Um, but he's a, he's a, uh, uh, wise, a wise old cowboy who educates about very complex topics. Um, so that this is a 78-year-old male with a history of a chronic indwelling Foley catheter. The catheter was placed for urinary retention. Now he's coming in pre-op for a total hip, um, and the the urine drawn off the catheter is horrendous. It shows four plus bacteria, WBCs, Luke esterase, the whole nine yards. It's a clean sample, no squamous epis. What do we do? Does he go straight to surgery? Do we start some antibiotics? Do we exchange the catheter? What is going on at your hospital? And even if you're not chiming in, I'm hopeful, especially those of you that are in a group are kind of talking amongst yourselves. Well, what do we do at our hospital with each of these cases? Um, because it really is the question of the day. Do these patients need antibiotics? Are we increasing their safety by giving them antibiotics before the procedure? Are we decreasing their safety? Are we giving them more risks without any benefits? Um, that's really what we're going to dive into today. These are our aims. As usual, we probably have people on the call who are new to antimicrobial stewardship. So we won't belabor the point, but we'll give a lay of the land. Why are we even talking about this? What are best practices in terms of antimicrobial stewardship? We'll review the best practices for asymptomatic bacteriuria. I think it's really important to go into this again because, you know, in the old days, all, all positive urinalyses were a urinary tract infection. And this is kind of a novel concept. I mean, it's not new, but it's novel to a lot of people um, as, as verified by 80% discordance in practice. So 80% of the time that we as physicians or clinicians encounter asymptomatic bacteriuria, we do opposite of what the guideline says. And so this is an area that's ripe for education and it's worth repeating. We'll go back to our case studies and kind of give our recommendations for what to do in each case. And then the meat of the presentation is really the literature review. We're going to look at the 2018 literature, at the extent of the world's literature on the topic, and come up with some best practices. My goal is for each of you to leave this presentation with the confidence and knowledge to make a recommendation to your joint care coordinator or to your surgeons on what to do next on this topic. So getting back to antimicrobial stewardship, the path of this here is pretty simple. Antimicrobials exert what's called selective pressure. So when you use an antibiotic, you, you know, if you imagine a sea of, of bacterial organisms, some are stronger than others. Which ones are going to die off first? Well, the weak ones are going to die off first. And if any are left after that course of antibiotics, it's going to be the strongest ones left. Well, those strongest ones will then reproduce. They'll populate your community biome. They even have plasmids and mitochondrial DNA so they can exchange their um, resistant genes between different organisms, um, and they can evolve to beat our antibiotics. Now, in the old days, we could just innovate our ways out, way out of this. We could make new antibiotics, um, but it's becoming harder and harder to do that, and so this is becoming more and more of an issue. In fact, as the world kind of um, adapts to modern medicine, as the uh, movement of antibiotics becomes more prevalent globally, we saw in the decade between 2000 and 2010 a 36% increase in antimicrobial use. At the same time, in the U.S., we saw that around 40% of all antimicrobial use was unnecessary. Unnecessary means we were using antibiotics to treat viruses, we were using too high a doses of antibiotics, we were using too broad a spectrum of antibiotics, or perhaps we were prescribing too long of course of antibiotics. And so that kind of leads right into the mantra here. The way to practice antimicrobial stewardship is to make sure you have the right diagnosis, you're using the right drug, you're using the right dose, and the right duration. Now, with pre-op urinalysis, it's really about the right diagnosis. You know, the thing we're talking about here is, are the organisms from the bladder causing an infection in the joint or in the surgical site? And if they are, well, then that probably requires a, an antibiotic. And if they're not, it probably doesn't. And so I think that's the crux of our conversation today is the right diagnosis. And the reason we focus on this, the reason we focus on these four Ds is because antimicrobial resistance is actually reversible. If we remove that selective pressure, if we use fewer antibiotics, 
we'll find that the, the community biome will repopulate with weak species and that our antibiotic um, efficacy will actually go up. We can preserve our antibiotic arsenal that's remaining um, as our drug companies and pharmaceutical industry find it more and more difficult to create novel agents. To build on that, in the 1980s, we had 16 new antibiotics. In the 90s, there were 10 new antibiotics. In the 2000s, only five. The low-hanging fruit had already been picked. Between 2008 and 2012, there was a single new antimicrobial discovered, and only 1% of the world's pharmaceutical industry has an active antibacterial discovery program. It is the major companies, but these aren't really cash cows. These are almost things that the, that the industry does as a service to medicine um, at this point. And so it, there really is an emphasis to preserve our arsenal that we already have. You know, I created this sign. It really should say this exit, multi-drug resistant organisms. We're already there. If you don't believe me, just go to your ICU. Um, I work in the emergency department. It's very rare that I have a shift where I don't see a patient with a multi-drug resistant organism. And the next exit where we're heading is really superbugs. Um, superbugs is kind of a slang term that refers to uh, bacterial organisms that are resistant to all antibiotics. They are already on our shores in the U.S. We've had now double-digit cases of um, patients dying because of organisms that are simply untreatable. Uh, the big scary one is the, um, the extended beta-lactamase E. coli. So right now they are still susceptible to carbapenems, um, but they are now C-R-E-E-S-B-L. And these are um, E. coli that are resistant to all antibiotics. Uh, and we've had a few cases already in the US. Now, in the old days, everyone died of infectious disease. Then we invented antibiotics. What does everyone die of now? Heart attack, stroke, cancer. There is talk among the world's scholars of a new era of infectious disease. If you look at the year 2000, about 5% of our bacterial organisms were resistant. If you look at the year 2014, we're up to around 10%. They actually think it's a success that this is a linear trend and not an exponential trend. But if this trend continues and we get to around 20% um, antibiotic resistance, uh, that is an era where it's going to be very dangerous to, dangerous to do routine things like surgery and childbirth, and where um, infectious disease is again going to outpace chronic disease as the lead killer. The UK actually commissioned a study on this. They said if left unchecked, deaths from multidrug resistant organisms will outpace cancer deaths by the year 2050 within our lifetime. So that's why we're here today. There are so many joint infections going on in every hospital across the country and so many patients receiving antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteriuria before the operation. Is this necessary? If it's not necessary, it will potentially save the health system Built millions of dollars and um, could obviously save quite a few patient lives uh, and combat the antimicrobial resistance epidemic that's going on worldwide. Now, this is the big question, right? What benefit is there to the patient to A, order a pre-op urinalysis or a urine culture before arthroplasty, and then B, right, treat it? Should, so should we be testing this in the first place? And then if we find an organism, should we be treating it? And I think we really need to talk about the pathophysiology here. So if you look at the little cartoon at the bottom, this is what we're, you know, this is the, this is the theory here. And if anyone has, a, has an alternate theory, please chime in and let me know. But the theory is you've got, you know, on, on your left there, you see E. coli. It uh, starts on the perineum. It crawls into the bladder and then populates the urine. Now we have a, a bladder full of bacteria. It ascends up the, uh, the ureter into the kidney. Now we have pyelonephritis. It goes into the glomerulus, seeds into the bloodstream, and then through hematogenous spread goes to the joint. All without symptoms. That's really the key here. We are not saying don't treat a patient with pyelonephritis. We are not saying don't treat a patient with dysuria and a positive urinalysis. The idea is, could this really happen? Could a bacteria go to your bladder, your kidneys, your bloodstream, and your joint with no symptoms whatsoever? It's an excellent question. Luckily, we have a lot of worldwide scholars who looked into it. Now, before we get into the literature, I think we all have to be on the same page about what asymptomatic bacteriuria is. The definition is simple, but the concept bears some, uh, a deep dive into details. It's an asymptomatic urinary tract infection. So this is a patient who had a appropriately collected urine sample and isolated bacteria without signs or symptoms referable to a urinary infection. Okay, this happens all the time, right? A urinalysis gets, urinalysis gets sent for whatever reason, you know, in my world, in the ED world, it's site clearance. 
every patient who's suicidal gets a urinalysis sent. So they will show up with bacteria on a regular basis. The patient has no dysuria, they have no frequency, they have no flank pain, they have no fever. Um, again, happens all the time. It's pretty common. So one of the common reasons for ASB or asymptomatic bacteriuria is transient ASB. So healthy women, that's two to 5%. So one in 20 women right now, they have a shorter urethra, a quicker trip from the perineum to the bladder, just hasn't peed in a while. The perineal bacteria has seeded to the bladder, it's starting to reproduce, and they flush their urine out with normal urination, and suddenly is once again a bacteria-free fluid. In pregnant women and diabetic women, it's a little bit higher, right? Bacteria eat sugar, that kind of makes sense. In pregnant women, the um, expanding uterus puts pressure on the ureters and the bladder, that kind of makes sense. But we're seeing about a one in 10 prevalence of asymptomatic bacteriuria in these populations. These next ones are the big three, the big three. The nursing home population or long-term care population, asymptomatic bacteriuria is between five and 50%. That makes a lot of sense, actually. It's about functional status. If it hurts to go to the bathroom, if it's painful to get out of bed and walk to the toilet, you're gonna pee less frequently, you're gonna have a higher chance of having your bladder colonized with bacteria. Spinal cord injury patients, 50%, they're self-cathing on a regular basis. That's introducing bacteria from the outside world into the bladder, they're colonizing their bladder with bacteria, but they're, but they're not having an infection, they're not having cystitis, they're not having hematuria, they're not having bladder spasm, they're not having fever, they simply have a colonized bladder where there's a, a biome of bacteria in their urine all the time um, that's not causing symptoms. And then for your long-term catheter patients, it's 100% of the time. There's not a lot of 100% in, uh, in medicine, but find a patient with a long-term indwelling catheter and draw a urine sample off that catheter. It will appear infected, it will grow something on culture. So what we're dealing with is a clinical phenomenon that's pretty common in the elderly, and patients with long-term catheters and spinal cord injury patients. You know, I mean, these are patients who are probably higher risk for getting a joint replacement as well. And so I think it's a pretty pertinent question, uh, how should we be dealing with this asymptomatic bacteriuria? Now you might ask, what's the harm? Um, as clinicians, it's easy to say, well, there are so many public health harms there, I'm dealing with my individual patient in front of me. And this is the individual patient argument. First of all, we're losing Cipro. I guess this is the public health argument, the first one. <laughs> but we're losing Cipro fast. We have about a 35% resistance rate to ciprofloxacin, which for, for a long time was the standard of care for urinary tract infection. Um, Cipro is our workhorse for outpatient pyelonephritis. If we lose that, we're going to be seeing pyelonephritis come into the hospital on a regular basis for IV antibiotics. And so that really is kind of a dire situation with ciprofloxacin. For the individual patient, um, these drugs just carry a high degree of side effects as well. So it's a 0.3 rate of antibiotic or of adverse drug events with antibiotics. But if you think about doing um, antibiotics pre-op for the number of patients across the nation, that number gets pretty high pretty quick. And these are not mild side effects. This is angioedema, this is anaphylaxis. Um, and then in the case of quinolones, it's uh, messing with your warfarin, warfarin coagulopathy, it's tendinopathies, it's QT prolongation. Um, so these are pretty serious side effects. Even if you don't get those, one in eight will have antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and then obviously we also have a C. diff epidemic going on as well. If you don't think there's a C. diff epidemic going on, go to your ICU. You'll find a patient with C. diff. Let's go back to our cases. Case one, we have an 82-year-old female. She doesn't have urinary symptoms. Should we even send the UA? The answer is no. This is screening, right? This is a screening urinalysis or a screening culture. Um, and it is simply not recommended prior to arthroplasty. We are gonna to get to the literature, um, but these are strong recommendations. They come from the Infectious Disease Society of America. They've been out for a decade. Um, this is simply putting the patient at risk for adverse drug events without any proven benefit, without a decrease in post-operative joint infection. In human medicine, there are exactly three times when it's okay to treat for ASB. And this is kind of nice because all you have to do is remember the times when it's okay to treat, and every other time you see ASB, do not treat it. So once in early pregnancy, if you have two positive urine cultures, so two and on separate visits, two positive urine cultures, there is evidence that in the pregnant population, ASB pr uh, progresses to pyelonephritis more frequently than in the non-pregnant population, and it probably has to do with functional mobility and pressure on the ureters. In the pre-urologic uh, procedure group, we do treat ASB. That kind of makes sense because you're actually instrumenting the urinary tract. 
So if there's bacteria in there, even if it's asymptomatic, um, if there's any sort of irritation to the mucosa, you might actually introduce that bacteria into the surrounding tissue. Makes sense. And then post renal transplant, traditionally we have been treating ASB in this population, just thinking they're immunocompromised and that graft is so precious. But there's actually a very um, strong body of literature growing against this. I think the next round of guidelines that comes out, you'll see that population actually drop down and our, um, our hall pass will be down to two. The hall pass does not include total arthroscopy patient, or total uh, arthroplasty patients. K2, so this patient already has a bad bug in their urine. They have pseudomonas in their urine, but no symptoms. Do we treat? Pretty similar argument, actually. Um, so this, for, this is a known uropathogenic organism, but it's not causing symptoms. The patient does not have cystitis at this time. She does not have pyelonephritis, does not have bacteremia. Ideally, we wouldn't have sent that UA in the first place, but knowing the organism doesn't change anything. This patient should proceed to surgery with no antibiotics. And finally, case three, our catheter cowboy. He is one of those long-term indwelling foleys. 100% of the time, they're gonna have um, asymptomatic bacteriuria. There is no need to exchange that catheter. There is no need to treat uh, urinary tract infection. And I think the main point here is this is not a catheter-associated UCI. So this is not a CAUTI. Um, it's really good that in our health system, we have a growing awareness of CAUTI, but I think it's important to just go over the diagnosis of it. To diagnose CAUTI, you must have symptoms. You must have symptoms. You must have symptoms. So CAUTI is really not for about the patients who have a long-term indwelling catheter. This is about patients who are hospitalized and get a catheter for a short amount of time. So I'm in a motor vehicle accident. A catheter is placed for nursing care, so you're not changing the bed sheets all the time, which is not best practice. And um, every day that I'm in that hospital, my risk of bacteriuria is 3%. So it just kind of adds up. And then around day three to five, I'm up in the 10 to 25% risk of having bacteriuria. And that's, or, um, and that's the time that you're going to develop CAUTI. Um, and so for those patients, you should actually absolutely exchange the Foley catheter and treat with usual antibiotics for pyelonephritis or complicated UTI. If you do that, you'll decrease morbidity and mortality in your hospital. You'll decrease mean ICU time. But this has nothing to do with the patient with a long-dwelling um, Foley catheter. That is not CAUTI. That is simply asymptomatic bacteriuria. I hope that distinction is clear. I kind of waffled on whether to include this slide, but there's so much confusion about CAUTI out there that I thought it was fine to just address the elephant in the room and make sure we were all on the same page. So it begs the question, right? This is 2018 literature. 70% of our orthopedic surgeons or our hospitals, you could say, or our joint journey programs are still treating preoperative um, pre asymptomatic bacteriuria. So why are they doing this? The mom in the cartoon makes a good point. She says, you need, or the, the, the friend there, he says, you need to strengthen your foundational argument. Um, I think we didn't have a strong foundational argument before, to be honest. The literature was still waffling back and forth. The guidelines were not consistent, and things actually changed in the year 2018. So when I first announced this journal club, and this journal club was actually inspired by our home orthopedist at our hospital, he asked me this very question, and I said, that's a great idea. Let's talk about this in a more public forum. Um, when I announced this journal club, we did not have a systematic review on the topic. We did not have a meta-analysis on the topic. Um, and as of summer 2018, we have both of those resources. So let's take a look at these guidelines. You know, the guidelines out there aren't as strong as I would have liked, a lot of international guidelines so far. And, you know, there's a lot of people against it. So, you know, of the 80% of the guidelines say we should not be treating asymptomatic bacteria before arthroplasty. But there's a glaring problem here. The one society that's advocating for it is the orthopedic society, right? So you've got the public health societies and the infectious disease doctors saying we shouldn't be treating this. And now we have the orthopedist saying, well, actually, we think you should. Um, and I, that voice is really, was really missing before. It was a strong orthopedic voice saying we should not be treating asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, and we've had some excellent randomized controlled trials published in orthopedic journals uh, that are now advocating against it. And that's a big sea change. Now, how did we get here? It all starts with a myth, right? You know, anytime the pendulum swings back and forth, but somewhere along the line, we just kind of get in the routine of doing something that's not necessarily evidence-based. And so I just wanted to visit the old literature to say how we got here in the first place. Um, in the 70s, it was actually, you know, that's when joint replacement was becoming uh, popular, was becoming widespread. And there was true, honest dialogue. Where are these infections coming from? 
So patients were getting delayed infection after surgery, surgical site infections and actual prosthesis infections, and people just didn't know where there was coming from. And there was a theory, it's hemato hematogenous spread. So a distal infection is seeding to the blood, which is seeding to the joint. It's a good theory, and it actually turns out to be a true theory. This does actually happen. But the question is just, well, where is this actually coming from? So if you look at these four citations on the right, we don't have to go deep into them, but these are case studies where, where surgeons are basically saying, hey, my patient had a pneumonia, then they had a joint infection. My patient had a urinary tract infection, then they had a joint infection. Um, and the fourth one there, Hall at the end, truly is a case of a urinary tract infection that seeded to the joint but it's not an asymptomatic infection. Again, I'm gonna just really hammer this point in. This was a patient who had dysuria who had flank pain. This was a case of pyelonephritis that seeded to the joint, which is a totally different entity. You should absolutely treat pyelonephritis. You shouldn't treat asymptomatic bacteriuria. Then we had these reviews. So, you know, there's a couple decades of literature came out. Now we've got some studies on the topic and the reviews came out in the 2000s. The problem was, well, it was twofold. One, the original studies were mostly retrospective. Retrospective data is really not the best for answering this kind of question. Um, and then the reviews themselves were uh, not systematic reviews. It wasn't a, a complete look at the world's literature, but rather some experts picking the articles that they thought were relevant and summarizing them. So the re first review, Tall et al. here in the year 2000, had seven studies, no randomized controlled trials. And they didn't really ask the question, is the asymptomatic bacteriuria causing the infection, but they, rather they asked, should these patients proceed to surgery? Um, and they were pretty honest about it. They said, it's, it's really unclear. The association between deep prosthetic infection and the presence of preoperative bacteriuria remains unclear. And then they went on to say, well, let's go ahead and treat anyway. Let's cover our, you know, let's cover our bases, go ahead and treat, um, and wait for better literature, literature to come out. Not unreasonable. The next review, this one, is it's not really a review at all. It's a um, dual authored study that's a single page in the Cleveland Clinical Clinic Journal of Medicine, which is like a magazine. So it's, um, it's a Cleveland Clinic's magazine on medicine, and it's widely cited as evidence for um, doing pre op your analysis before total joint arthroscopy, arthros or arthroplasty. So I have seen this article come up so many times, and if you read it, it's like three quarters of a page. And they're basically saying the same thing. They say, um, at this time, the evidence is limited, but um, a preoperative course of antibiotics preceding surgery seems reasonable. Seems reasonable. So again, not, not really a strong evidence base, but this is sometimes how MISC gets started, is there's a reputable source, a rep, you know, the Cleveland Clinic, right? And it's billed as a review. It literally says at the top of the title, a review, and um, it just kind of gets out there into the world. And then finally, this is the third review I found in the 2000s. It's from the Spanish language literature. Um, and again, they asked the question of whether to proceed to surgery if AF ASB is present. Um, it was five articles reviewed, no randomized controlled trials, and they actually found the infection rate was 0.1%, an extremely low infection rate, and then went on to make sort of a, you know, a recommendation quite to the opposite of that, saying, um, why don't we cover the theoretical possibility of bacteremia? So I love that word theoretical in there. They said, well, theoretically, this could still be happening. We just did the review. We found this is not happening, but theoretically it's good. So let's go ahead and cover our bases. And, you know, I, I, I have so much respect for the academic researchers. I'm not trying to belittle their work, but I think the conversation of the harm of antibiotics hadn't really entered the public sphere at this time. And now we're really in the business of weighing the benefits and harms of antibiotics. We have some very true, very real documented harms of antibiotics. Healthcare costs are spiraling out of control, and we have a chance here to de decrease patient harm and decrease healthcare costs by making a simple practice change. And I think that's why the conversation shifted to this. Oh, actually, my next slide. This is the last myth. <laughs> Our first um, prospective trial here. So we finally got to the point in 2009 where we're starting to look at the problem before we do the surgery. So we're no longer doing chart reviews. We're now looking at the patient's pre-op. And so this was a prospective trial, 550 patients, for a total knee arthroplasty, and they found that 36% of the ASB patients had a superficial joint infection, so not a prosthesis infection, but a surgical site infection, and 16% um, of the patients without ASB had a surgical site infection. So what did they conclude? They said, we have established that patients who present pre-admission with urinary tract colonization are a high-risk subgroup for wound infection postoperatively. So, it's, it's kind of true, their statement, but it's interesting too. They actually treated both groups. So even if you had 
um, asymptomatic bacteriuria, they still gave you an antibiotic and you still had a higher rate of infection. Not to get too geeky here, but you know, when you think about um, when you think about a theory, about a pathophysiology theory, you really need to establish causality. If they had wanted to establish causality here, they would have looked at the cultures. You know, I, I presume they had urine culture data. I presume they had wound culture data. Why not present that? No culture data was presented here. You would want to see that the urine, the bacteria in the urine actually matched the bacteria of the wound infection. Otherwise, it's about correlation. You know, is, uh, is the patient population with asymptomatic bacteriuria just more elderly? Are they more diabetic? Are they more frail? You know, those are all reasons you could have higher joints of surgical site infections um, that have nothing to do with bacteria coming from your bladder, seeding to your blood, seeding to the prostheses. And so, um, again, this is one of those studies that was very widely um, cited in supporting this practice. And I think the study missed the mark by not presenting the urine culture results um, in, you know, in, their, in their results. So here we are, folks. I was so happy to read this. I've read all of these articles. It's very interesting. You, you can just see the, the progression forming as we go through history here. Um, but in uh, um, 2013, we finally have the first randomized control trial. It's around 500 patients appropriately powered, um, and they found the, the infection rate was 0.9% uh, in the treated ASB group and 0% in the untreated group. Um, and I'll get into, that's actually kind of interesting. There's a, there's a modern theory that treating um, ASB, or basically receiving antibiotics in general, could actually increase your risk for postoperative joint infection. The way these infections work is that the, the bacteria actually form a little microenvironment on the prostheses. So they form what's called a biofilm. And a biofilm is an environment where bacteria can thrive. So it's a, it's a pathogenic complex where the bacteria can suddenly set up a colony and seed into the adjacent tissue. And when we treat patients with antibiotics, there's a theory that it actually kills off our natural biome, which disrupted that pathogenic complex. So we actually might have had a natural defense um, mechanism in place to prevent infection, and by treating with antibiotics preoperatively, we actually disrupt that natural defense. Now that's, that's kind of the future, that's not ready for prime time, but I do think we'll be seeing randomized controlled trials where we actually look at whether or not patients should receive any antibiotics before surgery, even that single dose of pre-op antibiotics. Um, especially in the age of, of really exquisite aseptic, aseptic technique, which our uh, orthopedic surgeons are practicing these days. I digress. Back to the study. Um, they basically found no statistical significance um, in whether or not they had ASB or not, and whether or not they were treated or not. Um, the bacteria cultured from the infected surgical wounds was totally distinct from the organisms isolated from the urine during surgery. As expected, in the urine, they were finding gram-negative organisms. In the joint infections, they were finding gram-positive organisms. And the authors made a pretty strong statement. They said, we identified no case of post-operative joint infection from urinary origin in patients with asymptomatic bacteriuria, whether or not they had been treated with antibiotics. And they went on to say that ASB is not a cause of post-operative orthopedic surgical site infection, and treatment of bacteriuria prior to surgery is not recommended. Pretty strong statement. And if you look at who commissioned the study, it says clinical orthopedics and related research. So we are now in the orthopedic literature here. Um, and then there, there's been a lot of studies. I chose the RCT for obvious reasons. And then this one I want to present in case there's administrators in the room, in case there are joint journey coordinators in the room. Um, I don't know if you call it joint journey. That's what we call it at my hospital. Um, this study actually looked at cost. And this is important because if you want to change practice, you have to come at it from multiple arguments. You know, the science is one argument of it, but you can always have a guideline war, right? You can have um, one person holding up their guideline, another person holding up their guideline. You can always have a, a study war. Well, my study says this. Well, my study says this. But the cost um, argument is actually pretty convincing. So in this study, they looked at around 2,200 patients. They had uh, no statistical significance difference, whether you had ASB or whether you didn't, in terms of um, postoperative joint infection. They once again found that the culture from the joint infection did not match the culture from the urine, and they saved their health system $20,000 per year. I love how the authors say this. They say, discontinuing routine processing of screening urine cultures prior to elective joint arthroplasty resulted in substantial reduction in urine cultures ordered and antimicrobial prescriptions for asymptomatic bacteriuria without any significant impact on the incidence of post or prosthetic joint infection. 
This simple change would be scalable across institutions with potential for significant healthcare savings. This is kind of my plea to you guys today. This simple change would be scalable across institutions with potential for significant healthcare savings, and I would say significant healthcare safety as well. And here we go. I was so excited when these came out. I kind of knew, you know, you can look on the on the um, database and see what's coming down the pike. So I kind of knew they were coming down the pike, but I was so excited when they both got published prior to this presentation. The Wang article is actually still in electronic form, and these are readily available. Truthy, we can email these out to the to all the participants on the call. Um, but let's go straight to the systematic review and the meta analysis. So just to recap, a systematic review is when you um, you have a system in place to scour all of the databases, you know, not just the orthopedic literature, not just the infectious disease literature, but truly the world's literature to make sure you're not missing any articles. And you take all of the world's articles, you read them all, and you come up with some conclusions. And so this study found eight relevant articles. Um, oh, and I should, I should mention, this doesn't include things like case reports. So these are actually case control studies, randomized control trials, where you have a group A and a group B, and you can actually see that an experiment was performed. So they had five um, cohort studies, prospective cohort studies, um, two retrospective case control studies, and then one randomized control trial. They looked at about 10,000 patients, and of those 10,000 patients, they had about a 6% rate of ASB, and that's a pretty normal rate. And they said that ASB does not act as a source of hematogenous dissemination or direct spread of the pathogen that causes infection after joint replacement, pretty simply. Patients receiving arthroplasty, um, perioperative treatment of ASB does not provide benefits. Con conversely, it could actually lead to augmentation of antibiotic resistance, economic burden, and allergies. ASB is not a contraindication for arthroplasty, and the routine practice of, peri of preoperative screening for and treatment of ASB should not be continued. I leave these full quotes in here on purpose because if you are going to a committee meeting, if you are presenting a summary of the evidence, if you have any need for this information, just this is directly from the author's mouth and you'll have the paper to back it up. Um, I think we can really make a compelling argument based on the systematic review um, that this should not be standard of practice. I'd like to see those numbers, those 70-30 numbers of who's doing pre-op screening flip next year, at least in Wisconsin, right? We, we can be on the leading edge of this. Now here's the meta-analysis. Meta-analyses are a little bit different than systematic reviews. These are looking at articles where they have comparable data. So they're trying to compare apples to apples. So they say, okay, in these five studies, we have usable data. We can say with confidence that this data is similar enough that we can pool it all together and get some metadata. Now I know that eight and five are still pretty low numbers. These aren't as high of numbers as you'll see for aspirin and acute MI or for um, you know different things. But for an antibiotic stewardship topic, this is actually pretty decent numbers. And so I'm very excited. They had 3,500 joint arthroplasties and 441 cases of ASB. So again, pretty good, pretty good rates, pretty consistent with the literature. And it showed that prosthetic joint infection was more common in patients in the ASB group. Let's just take a moment there. So again, we're finding this, this finding that the asymptomatic bacteria urea patients have a higher rate of postoperative joint infection. That's not a problem. Once again, they found that the culture results did not meet, match the urine results. And the authors finally laid it out there. They said, you know, what everyone's been thinking for years now, um, that uh, the joint infection occurring via hematogenous route from the general urinary tract harboring bacteria is impossible. These are the author wrote, this is impossible. This pathophysiology does not make sense in the absence of symptoms. Preoperative antibiotic treatment has no benefit. And a plausible explanation for the modest incidence of increased uh, postoperative joint infection in ASB patients could be that ASB is an indicator of frailty and increased susceptibility to infection. So this very well could be that we're dealing with a nursing home population, extreme elderly, with diabetes, and that's the reason we're seeing increased joint infections. It is correlation, it is not causation. The organisms simply do not match. Now, this has all kind of been framed in the negative thus far, right? Don't treat ASB, don't treat ASB, don't treat ASB. Well, how about what, what can we do? What we can do is all the wonderful thing that our surgeons are already doing. I mean, I am just astounded by the quality of orthopedic surgery and the really attention to detail and aseptic technique that our surgeons have been going through over the last decade. I mean, when you walk into a, into a arthroplasty room, it looks like a spaceship now. You know, you've got the hoods on, the air is clean, the sterilization techniques, the check mark um, 
you know, the checklist going through surgical techniques. It's really astounding. Um, but we can focus on air quality control in the operating room. We can focus on complete skin disinfection um, and, uh, and minimize infections related to materials or staff. We can um, think about impairment of the patient's immune system, whether they should be stopping steroids before surgery, you know, which, joint, which patients we should actually be choosing for surgery. And then there's a lot of talk about bacterial biofilm formation. Now, how we're going to solve that, uh, that problem is very interesting. So there's a lot going on with medical technology, actually designing prostheses that disrupt bacterial biofilm formation. There's a lot uh, dealing with technique. But I think that's a topic that's going to get a lot of traction in the next few years. And then finally, hematogenous spread really does exist. So it's not like we're, that this pathophysiology doesn't make sense. Infections certainly can seed from the bloodstream into the joint, but not in an asymptomatic urine infection. If your patient has a pneumonia, treat the pneumonia. If your patient has pyelonephritis, treat the pyelonephritis, but don't treat the asymptomatic infection. That's, the, that's that, that subpopulation of patients where we could really do a lot of um, good for our population, our community biome, and for our individual patients by stopping this um, non-best practice. So here are my final summary and recommendations. I left a little bit of time at the end um, early because I really want to hear from the audience Specifically, if there's surgeons out there who have questions or if there's joint journey coordinators out there who have questions, um, I wanted to make sure that we had covered all our bases today. Um, but in summary, ASB is common, especially in the elderly um, and the long-term catheter population. There are zero randomized controlled trials that show that ASB causes postoperative joint infection. And there is one high-quality randomized controlled trial that shows that ASB does not cause postoperative joint infection. The systematic review and the meta-analysis on the topic agree that we should neither be testing nor treating for ASB prior to arthroplasty. And so if that's still going on at your hospital, that would be a great quality improvement project that you could work on in the next calendar year. And we would be happy to help you with it if you want primary literature, if you wanted me to make some key connections with your orthopedic surgeons or with your infectious disease department, um, I'd be happy to help out. Our recommendations are simple. Remove urinalysis and urine culture from the surgical pre-op checklist. You will save your hospital thousands of dollars per year. You can still screen. You know, if you're calling your patient a week before the surgery, you can ask, do you have urinary symptoms? Um, and then if they have urinary symptoms, go ahead and test. And then encourage your patient. Say, if you develop urinary symptoms in the next week before surgery, please let us know. But don't test routinely. Um, and then you can confirm symptoms before treating if the PCP or another provider who is doing the preoperative um, clearance uh, presents with a positive UA or positive urine culture. So I understand sometimes patients come from outside your health systems, because sometimes they come to your office already holding the data, um, but you can just confirm that they actually have symptoms. If a patient has pseudomonas growing on their urine culture without symptoms, you really don't need to be treating that patient prior to surgery. Not all bugs are bad bugs. Transient bacteria urea is common, and I welcome your question on the topic. Again, everyone, if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and unmute your line so we can hear the question. Or if you'd uh, rather not, not do that, you can type it in the chat and uh, we will answer them as we get them. There's a lot of tongue twisters in this talk, too. So you can say ASB and PJI. I try not to use acronyms if I can, but. <laughs> Is there anyone out there who disagrees? It's an important question, right? Because our surgeons are being, they're being deemed for joint infections. And, you know, it's linked to reimbursement. Um, and obviously there's a personal suffering. If your patient suffers a joint infection, uh, that's really stressful for a surgeon. That's a lot more um, pain and suffering for the patient. That's a lot more work. That's a lot more attention to detail. Sometimes that results in an amputation. Sometimes that re results in a repeat surgery. I'm not saying this is no big deal. If there are surgeons out there who think this is not ready for prime time um, and are willing to speak up, I would love to hear your opinion.
All right. It was wonderful presenting you to, to you today. Um, as usual, I usually get about 10 to 20 emails after these presentations, so I look forward to your emails afterwards. And um, please consider me a resource if you are considering this practice change at your hospital. I would be happy to provide these resources to the key people who need to know before making that decision. Thanks for attending. All right, thank you everyone for joining our fourth and final journal club. Um, I will be emailing all the registrants a document with instructions on how to get your CME credit, as well as the resources that Dr. Redwood just uh, mentioned during the talk. Please note that the portal uh, to get your CME credit will be active starting right after this event and will close on November 15th at 4 p.m. Central. Um, again, this is only offered to those that have been here for the live session. Uh, we will also make a recording available to uh, all those that weren't able to make it to today's event or if you'd like to share them with others in your organization. Um, and then since this is the final one of these, I'd like to put out an open call for topics or suggestions for future journal clubs. It doesn't have to be antimicrobial stewardship. If you have a need um, for any of the other HIN topics, please let me know and we'd be happy to put together education. Thanks everyone and have a good rest of the week.